Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the second day of the sixth International Symposium on Environmental Sociology in East Asia. We have another day of inspiring lectures lined up for you. And now, please welcome to the stage the chair of ISESEA 6 Committee and the president of this conference, Professor Zhou Guitian, to the stage. Everyone, good morning. Uh, I think it's my honor to chair uh, this uh, keynote speech. We are very honorable to invite the Professor uh, Ilan Chapi to uh, uh, give us uh, the talk. I think uh, he will give us very wonderful and inspired yeah, talks and what he organized the uh, Classica. Yeah. And let me shortly uh, introduce the, uh, Professor Ilan Chapi and the Classica. Professor Ilan Chapi is head of the International Fellowship Incubator and uh, the Knowledge Learning and the uh, Societal Change uh, International Research Alliance at the Institute uh, for Advanced Sustainable World, uh, Studies in Potsdam, Germany. I think this uh, IASS, this research institute is very important that would uh, uh, con constructed by uh, uh, Germany uh, premier, uh, Merkel, that after uh, she uh, met so many important scholars in the world, and uh, the scholar suggest that uh, in the very transformative the world, that, that, that Germany have to build uh, these kinds of the transdisciplinary uh, research center and the research institute. So this is uh, the goal of our RSPRC. I would like to say that. And then the Professor Ilan Chabi, uh, actually the very important uh, uh, leaders uh, in the uh, program of Classica. Let me also yeah, uh, read what uh, Ilan Chabi yeah, writes about Classica. Classica is an international research network uh, that seeks to identify and understanding condition under which collective behavior change toward just and uh, E uh, equitable, sustainable future occurs or fails to, uh, to occur at different scales and contexts, and uh, to use that understanding to advance solution for and promote action on pathway to sustainable future. I think this is actually the yesterday we hold in the whole days we discussed and uh, we exchanged our research idea topic and. Uh, also some uh, political uh, experience. So it's, it's very important. Uh, as so many yeah, colleagues yeah, uh, proposed, we might uh, to construct a close uh, network or platform in our region or in the world. And then we can gather our uh, experience and, uh, and, uh, uh, and learn by each other how can we actually use our knowledge use our knowledge production to actually to promote uh, the deep, uh, to the, the better future uh, in the very uh, difficult situation. You know, now we can see that a lot of challenge. Yeah, uh, yesterday, the newspaper said in Taiwan, now today's report, it's over the nine uh, million people died in the air pollution in India and in China. I think this is not included in yeah, Japan, Taiwan, South Korea, and so on. So we have the actually very big challenge, the, not only in the uh, superficial uh, phenomena of air, air pollution. We have to go back to see what is the behind, uh, 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 what, yeah, what is behind the scene, what is the source of the air pollution. So the policy making or the industrial transition or the climate transition. I think all of the issues, yeah, in these two days we discussed is very, very important. So I think, uh, yeah, for this uh, uh, important topic, the Professor uh, Ilan Chapi will give us the, today, yeah, very uh, important and inspired yeah, talk. So he will bring us the topic, narrative models and the societal change, yeah, 
welcome Professor Dan Chapi. I'll trade you. Wonderful. Yeah, I, that's a, that I had. So thank you very much, Professor Joe. I I am delighted to be here and uh, excited again to visit Taiwan. I have been here a number of times, and each time have learned more. And certainly from yesterday's proceedings, both the specific sessions and the. Uh, keynotes, I really gained a great deal from that. And so I'm delighted to be able to share in this and hope that we all learn from each other in this kind of a context. I think it's important that we have these contexts in different places and in different ways of sharing ideas. The idea that we are engaged in mutual learning is essential if we're going to meet the kinds of challenges that we have, and I will talk more about that. Before I start, maybe a quick note. Um, I'm coming at this, if you will, not in a traditional sociological perspective, though I hope I have been able to adapt some of that, but also from someone who has done a lot of physical science, laser physics and chemistry, as well as designed learning environments for museums, and then undertook to understand psychology, social psychology, cognitive psychology, and sociology as relevant to the kinds of challenges which, are, which have no boundaries between disciplines. The challenges we face are those which are which lie across these dimensions. And therefore, we need to learn how do we talk to each other. And that's another important part of such a wonderful gathering, is simply learning our languages. And I don't mean between Korean, Japanese, English, etc. That's already a problem. But we can face that. But the difficult thing of learning to talk across disciplines. More on that as we go. Let me just quickly start with one thing. How many people here, for how many people is the term Anthropocene familiar? Is that a, something that most people are, have heard or know about? We'll come back to that in a minute. But the basic idea is that humanity, humankind, has made profound changes in the Earth on a level that is discernible, is visible, and will remain visible on a geological time scale, both time and spatial. So it's not about small changes. It's the fact that humanity has now made changes in the world, on this planet, that are deeply affecting all of us all of the time. So we are so-called living in the Anthropocene era. That brings up two very critical starting points, fundamental ideas. One of them is thinking about systems as opposed to individual components. And the other, which is very much linked to that, is thinking about complexity. And I will talk more about what I mean by those. But those are essential ideas if we are going to talk about science, society, and sustainability. I would posit also that collective behavior change is needed to respond to these changes, global changes, in all the very different conditions and contexts of social and ecological systems across the planet. And for those changes, a big component, an important aspect that I think we have not paid sufficient attention to is the idea of narratives. Narratives both in the sense of visions of what might be or what we would like to be. Where would we like our society, our community, our family, whatever, to be at some point in the future? And narratives of identity. 
And we heard some of that very eloquently in, in Riley Dunlap's talk yesterday. Um, how they play a role in either helping or hindering policy and behavior change. And modeling these kinds of, creating models, system dynamics models, agent-based models, simple heuristics, all kinds of models um, that address co the options and the consequences. They are not about predicting. They are about providing a set of plausible options in going forward with these complex system, and I would include games in this, which I will, if I have time, get to at the end. Um, the real point is that should expand our space for thinking about innovation, and social innovation in particular. So, welcome to the Anthropocene. We got in, we can't just turn around and go back out. Um, I think it's a good image. And I just point out, because I will come back to him later, this was originally coined around 2000 by Paul Crutzen and Gene Sturmer, and I will come back to Paul later. So very quickly, because I think this is familiar to everyone, in fact, there was an excellent talk by uh, one of the people from P, uh, RSPRC yesterday on the planetary boundaries. So yes, there are clear, defined at this point, some more so than others, limits to what we can extract from the Earth, what we can use and reuse. And that's part of the story. And it's a critical story, whether land use, fresh water, ocean acidification, the whole list is here. But another way to look at this is Will Steffen's uh, hockey stick story, the idea that all of these cases, and, and they're, you don't have to read them, but the point is just that they have this characteristic of, well, here's a pretty good one, pr primary energy use, very flat, slight increase, and suddenly around 1950, huge change. So all of these, both in the social, in the Earth system dimensions, and in social dimensions show rather similar behaviors. One, as human population has expanded rather dramatically, and as our use of technology, which is wonderful, it helps us do all kinds of things, and it also gets us into great trouble because of unintended consequence. The result of this is that the whole idea, starting for at least publicly, in 1987 with um, Gro Harlan Brundtland's Our Common Future Report for the UN. Um, and there are different ways of showing uh, the ideas of um, sustainable development. Um, one of them, which is the most common, the social, ecological, economic uh, pillars. There have been other uh, formulations of it. That's fine. And it sets this up as to what it is we want to do. But these are, in fact, complex systems. They are not reducible into one pillar or another. If you do something in one domain, you will affect the others. And trying to reach something that is, as they put it, bearable, equitable, and viable to reach sustainable is a very difficult task, and that's the challenge, which has now been formalized into the UN's Sustainable Development Goals. Well, those goals themselves are very important, and it's very important to have them labeled and put there in front of us in very specific ways. This is a huge step but it's only the very first step in this because, number one, again, complex systems means that we can't reduce inequalities or get to zero hunger without dealing with things like gender equality, water, sustainable cities and communities, affordable and clean energy, et cetera. So these are interdependent. 
They're not, in, they're not independent. They're interdependent. They link to each other. And there are many sub-goals and, and implementum, implementation targets, 169 if I remember right. Um, but it means that, that we deal with a very complex system in our society. So let me make a few comments about that. I think what's obvious is that society is inextricably embedded in the natural systems on which it is entirely dependent. It's sort of funny. It, I, I have had this experience that you talk to people about natural systems and whatever and uh, ecosystems, and they say, oh, yeah, 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 I know. There's a very nice forest a few kilometers over there. I said, no, what are you breathing? What did you drink? What are you wearing? That's all part of the ecosystem, and we are dependent on that. So the point is that society and the built environment, here we are, um, form a complex system, society and the built environment, interacting with the natural systems, which are themselves complex systems. So this is a very highly interconnected and unreducible, irreducible system. But what happens is that societies are the ones that define what is important to them about the world around them. It is not in some ways formally given. It is not the same in every community, every culture, every environment. So it's about what do we value, each of us in our communities value in our environment. Is it the gold in the ground that we want to dig up? as in the gold rush in California? Is it the air we breathe and we'd like to have clean air? Is it the water we drink? Is it the, <clears throat> the foods we produce locally? As we heard yesterday from Professor Juju Wong, a wonderful project of creating value in that environment. So as a result, Sustainability itself depends on how people conceive of their relationship to their environment broadly, their ecosystem, their, their social and ecosystem. <clears throat> Excuse me. And therefore, it depends on their own sense of agency and responsibility. In other words, what can I do and what should I do? And those two ideas, agency, responsibility, what can I do, what should I do, are what come out of understanding how these systems are intertwined, are connected. And I would say that where this leads us, and much of my focus, if you will, is saying for well-being, and in fact, really, in our survival, it means that we have to learn continually. We can't go back and look it up in the book and say, oh, we just do what, what we did before. Doesn't work because these are new problems and they will continue to be new problems. It isn't like we'll solve a few problems, then everything's fine, don't worry about it, we're good. Won't work. We will have to be continually in a process of developing. But what's also important is that we need to think about innovation for society's needs, not only for market purposes. I spent close to 20 years running a company in Silicon Valley that I started. And Silicon Valley is very exciting, and there's lots of <clears throat> fantastic innovation, market innovation, and so forth. There are a number of the people whose names you would know that were part of the circle in which I functioned and my investors were part of that. Great, fantastic 
new products. We're all carrying some of them, like iPhones and such like. But we also have to think about how they affect society and what is it that societies need, not just what we produce and, and then convince people that they absolutely have to have it. Um, we need to think carefully about the co-design process in this matter, as was also brought up yesterday. So a, a couple of words about complex systems. Some of you, I'm sure, are very familiar with this, but if you'll allow me, let me make a few observations. Because actually, complex systems, the basic ideas are simple. That may seem like an oxymoron, but it's not. Because really what it is, is that they have those characteristics that, number one, they're in a system, and therefore there are boundaries. Every cell in the body acts as a system in and of itself, as well as part of a much larger system, our, our whole body. But the cell itself has boundaries. Now, the boundaries are not rigid, not impermeable. Some things get through, some things don't. And so there is a constant process. And without that, there would be no life. So whether that is the system boundary of a cell in your body or the system boundary of the city in which you live, there is a metabolism, an ecosystem that is happening as we sit here, as we speak. Um, the components in that system both within the cell and between cells, are interacting all the time. But because they do, there are feedback loops. So if I move my hand and touch this desk, I get a feedback on my fingers that tells me, yes, I've made contact here. And that feedback, though, in broad societal terms, can be spatially very far away because we're in a global system. It can be delayed in time by microseconds, nanoseconds, or decades or centuries. So the effects, if you will, if you run a nuclear power plant and you produce waste material that's highly radioactive, that starts a feedback loop that has a very, very long return time before it ha is back to non-highly non radioactive, 10,000 years, 100,000 years, depending on the isotopes. So feedback loops connect interdependent components. And that means that these feedback loops can be either positive and reinforce a, an effect or negative. A, a simple example, you know about the melting of the ice in the Arctic, the sea ice cover. It's decreasing very rapidly and has over the last number of years so that the, the total extent in, in summertime is much less than it used to be. Well, there's a feedback loop there because once that sea ice is gone, in, I mean, not, not even that it's completely, I mean right now, even with partial cover. What it means is that the Arctic Ocean is absorbing more sunlight. It's not reflected by the ice. So the ocean itself is warming up. There's a higher degree, a higher loading of, of um, moisture in the atmosphere in the Arctic. It results in Arctic lows, so-called. And guess what? changes the path of air circulation in the North Pole region, which gets pushed down into, particularly in the US, but also in Siberia and Russia and, and Europe, and you end up with very cold winters. And people say, yeah, but what do you mean global warming? It's colder. Yeah, because of global warming. <laughs> So it, in some ways, we made a mistake by talking about global warming. It's really about instability and change in the global climate system. 
but that's a case of a positive feedback loop because the more ice you lose, the more that effect is evident. By the way, the other thing that happens, which I just was in, I'll, I'll show you a picture later, in some Arctic communities, for example in Alaska, they've got to move the whole city, town. Why? Because the ice is gone, so the wave action becomes much harder, much higher waves, stronger, and it's basically chopping off the land on which the city was built. And they literally have to move the city. So feedback loops can have all kinds of consequences. And again, people starting to use fossil fuel in the Industrial Revolution weren't planning on global warming and moving communities in the Arctic. Never occurred to them. Unintended consequence. So the, the point is that there can be these kind of effects are nonlinear. That means they can, they can be irreversible or have hysteresis. It means that they have thresholds. So things are OK, 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 boom. It just changed. And it doesn't go back just by reversing things. And that's, for example, one of the fears about the ocean circulation and the so-called thermohaline um, circulation between the Gulf Stream in the Caribbean and the northern part of the um, Atlantic Ocean, which were it to, to reverse, would mean that we would enter a very serious ice age if, uh, in northern Europe and, and America and would have in fact effects around the world. So the point is that this complexity leads to inherent uncertainty, not because we're doing bad science. Number one, science changes all the time, otherwise it wouldn't be very useful. But two, because there's an ambiguity. In, a few, in effect, it's an indeterminate causality. When you have all these things connected, it's really hard to say, well, this happened because of that. And we see this played out in the public discourse around climate change. You say, well, we had horrible hurricanes and so forth. Oh, it's not because of climate change. Well, in fact, we don't have a simple proof because it is complex. We think that it's, it is a consequence of global warming, but it's not a simple one-to-one -one correlation. And it has two other important characteristics. One I mentioned, unintended consequences, unanticipated consequences. But it also has the fact that there are emergent properties. And that's what leads to the unintended consequences. Things happen because things are coupled in very complex ways. And if we, in fact, don't know exactly what those are, and in many cases we don't, then things will happen that we cannot anticipate. More on that later. So what I'm interested in, as Professor Joe mentioned in the beginning, is really about what changes in behavior are needed to deal with the sustainable development goals. It's nice to have the goals. How the hell do we get there? We need to make changes. What changes? What kinds of conditions can or do collectives, if you will, communities, groups, whatever, um, do that would allow change that would be towards a more effective future for that community, that collective, whatever it is? There are a lot of questions embedded in that. How can socially innovative collective behavior change be initiated and supported? I'll come back to that in terms of social movements. How can all sectors of societies, which includes the scientists, as part of society, not separate from, um, or if you will, experts. Experts are only experts in a small domain. They are not experts in the rest of life for, and how other people need to function and where they go. How can we co-design new knowledge? collaboratively design new knowledge and uh, produce new knowledge and 
design research, for example? What about social movements? And what is it about sustainability as a social movement that's different than movements like labor movement, women's rights, civil rights? It's different because it's not very simple, defined, well, just do this and this will be fine. I will get a better salary. I will get equal rights in the, mark, in the uh, workplace. We don't have that kind of a metric when we're talking about sustainability. In essence, we don't know what sustainability looks like. So this is a very tough road to go, but essential one. So as Professor Joe very nicely said in the introduction, what I did was started about 10 years ago, um, a institution known as the uh, knowledge, Learning, and Societal Change Alliance, a research alliance, which now, to make it easier than reading the whole name, I just call it Classica, but spelled as you see it. Um, but the idea is to understand collective behavior change and the conditions that lead to it or block it, and then to try to use that knowledge that we gain from that to actually support those changes and move things forward. So why, why do I focus on collective behavior change? I think it's great if you take your garbage out and separate it. It's great if we do individual actions. We do grow vegetables in our garden and use that. We do use local products. That's wonderful. But the kinds of large-scale changes mean we have to act together. We have to act as communities. We have to act across countries. We have to act in a collective sense. And part of it is because if you work, act individually, you can act at cross purposes. It's incoherent, if you will. Um, it's unclear in these complex situations what your actual impact is. What actually, you, I did something, did it matter? I don't know. So it's, it's hard when we work totally alone. And the effects may not be right where we are. It may be an effect somewhere else that we don't even know and we don't, can't assess it. And also I would say that it's important that we develop the social norms that allow for collective action and behaviors. So, um, Making short-term decisions wisely, strategically, is difficult. People want to make short-term decisions, but they want to do it on short-term basis, not thinking, how does this actually help me later or hurt me later? So in many cases, decisions have been made that were very detrimental in the long term. Part of it is because we don't anticipate it and can and part of it is because the political system is rigged for the short term in general. So I'm interested in these communities or collectives of purpose. And I emphasize that the purpose because it's not that you need a group of people who think the same. You can have a group of people who think very differently and may not even like each other at all. And I'll give you an example of working with that shortly. So highly contested, conflicted situations nonetheless are critical to this because those are the cases where we have to find some kind of solutions. But the point is if there is a, an agreed goal or an identifiable goal that can be approached with different ideologies, if you will, but where there's a confluence on that goal, then something can happen from that. And part of that is that we need local, traditional, tacit, procedural knowledge as part of what we do when we're talking about social ecological systems. It's not just what's written in our textbooks or in our elegant papers, it's what do farmers know, fishermen know, reindeer herders, workers in the oil field, 
it's those knowledge of specific context which also has to play a role in how we make these decisions and how we understand the solution that works in communities. I don't like the term sustainable development for many reasons. I prefer the term sustainable futures, and I use the plural intentionally, because there is no sustainable future, singular, for the globe. We need them to work together, but it depends. When I'm working with communities in northern, northwestern Siberia, or in New Greenland, it really doesn't have much to do with the co conditions that my graduate student works with in the Kibere slum near Nairobi. Very different context, sorry. Culture, context, conditions. Yet, what we're looking for is are there common issues and common processes that we can employ to make it work in these different contexts. And as I said in the very beginning, what becomes really important is that we find ways to engage in mutual learning, just as we're doing here, but to do that even in societies and conditions where we have a great deal of conflict. One of the wonderful examples here was right in this building, um, November 2016. We very kindly, from the hosting here by Professor Joe and his colleagues, who did a fantastic job of helping us set this up and of participating in these discussions, we had a wonderful set of discussions of case studies in, East, in Asia and the Pacific Islands of collective behavior change or efforts to move in that direction towards sustainability. And we learned quite a bit from that, but this is just the beginning, just the beginning. So there were a number of things that we, and these are very condensed, so it's, it is, there's much more to the story, but just to illustrate, and I won't go through all of these, but men manage, mention the, a couple that are very important. I mean, all of them are important, and all of them play a role. And you can see, I think they're, you can read them. But the idea of really bringing together bottom-up assessment of needs, so co-design issues, with top-down policy and structural questions is essential. It's important also to keep in mind, and this it turns out to not always to be so obvious, to link the global with the lo local. So it isn't just about the local conditions, but the fact that these are, again, always coupled on a larger scale. Um, to develop narratives that resonate with local cultures, to develop and use them, and I'll talk a little more about narratives in a moment. Um, and to consider, which I think is often um, maybe dropped, the, the next to the last one, not number nine, to jointly develop, to co-develop economic, cultural perspectives and alternatives for the people who are disadvantaged by the changes that are happening. So it's not only can we find a great solution and we say, wonderful, great, we're, we're doing fantastically. Well, not everybody's going to benefit, or they're going to benefit in different ways. So we need to make an effort very explicitly to make this as workable for different parts of the community, whatever that community may, might be. Also, I would say the other thing which comes up with NGOs very often, or projects that are set up, what do you do when the money runs out? You just drop the project and we forget about it? Um, probably not such a good idea. So how do you plan for this to begin with? How do you deal with the long-term development of capacity, really? So following the workshop, the, the symposium here in Taipei in, in November 2016, we just had a uh, workshop in Leuphana University in Germany in Lüneburg 
um, on really looking at models, narratives, and, and experiments. Um, this was really to follow up, looking at the case studies we did here, but also of five new case studies that we looked at from Europe and one from India, um, in which we attempted to say, can we identify a narrative in that, number one, that played a role in whether people were engaged in this effort or not? And the answer was, in most cases, we could. But two, if we can identify narratives, can we also use those as the kernel, as the base, for creating agent-based models of understanding motivation in social systems? And the answer to that is we don't know. We didn't get far enough. Um, but that's one of the things I will come back to in a minute. So much of what I'm talking about has gotten its own buzzword these days, transdisciplinary research. And I, I want to talk about that because I've already alluded to it in several ways. By this, we mean not only that we're working across disciplines, but we're doing that in full collaboration with people who either can influence the outcomes in a particular situation or who are affected by it, or both. The so-called stakeholders. Actually, in many cases here and elsewhere, it's not only stakeholders, but rights holders, such as indigenous populations. Um, and it's a pro process of designing the research questions and process of producing relevant knowledge, of distributing and utilizing the outcomes. What's important here is, and this I get immediate reaction from some of my colleagues in various disciplines saying, what do you mean, co-design it? I know how to do the research. I'm not going to go and ask somebody to tell me how to do my research. Well, no, I'm not saying that they're going to tell you how to do your research, but they're going to tell you whether it matters to them and whether it's worth doing it. And that matters a great deal. Otherwise, the, it's not that the narrowly disciplinary research is not important, but it is insufficient for these kind of complex social systems. So we want to do this in a sense because it's about the capacity and responsibility to act, the agency and responsibility I mentioned earlier. It's about building ownership of solutions and a commitment to them. If you don't have that, you can have all the policies you'd like. And either corruption or just plain ignorant or ignorance of the solutions means nothing happens. And there are lots of, unfortunately, all too many examples of that. But you also need a vision. You need to want to move somewhere. There has to be a strong enough vision that it's worth getting up out of your chair and doing something. And if you don't have that vision, why bother? If we don't have a clear sense that there's something we can do together, if we don't have the sense we are capable, and there is a desirable future, we don't move. And then the linking to global and the idea of also, from my point of view, of trying to identify and develop both empowering and visionary narratives. So very briefly, I, I would say, following also on the wonderful talks yesterday, um, that it's important to think about how is information used. And we can talk about science and the media all we want, but there's a wonderful uh, paper from 2005, which I like, among other things, because the title is great. It says, I'll see it when I believe it, not the other way around. But what does that mean? It is exactly this question of cultural cognition or of bias, of confirmatory bias, as cited here. In other words, if I don't, if I believe one sort of class of things, a set of ideas, and you tell me something that's totally different, 
my first reaction is just shut it off. It's wrong. It's fake news. You've heard that somewhere before. I can't remember. Somebody said that. Anyway, um, it's really a way of dismissing what is uncomfortable for us or is inconvenient. As Al Gore put it, the inconvenient truth. But in fact, those are what we confront very often in different ways. And so we need to think about how we use media. I was part of a very interesting workshop at the Technion in Israel in um, last June on social media and science communication. And part of what we tried to ask is how did different communities respond? We, in fact, just did a blog post on this. Um, and it's very important to understand Number one, that different communities read the same material in different ways, and that the need to adapt to community narratives and ways of seeing the world, not to change what you want to say, but to re recognize that you have to make a link. I'd spent 20 years running a company in Silicon Valley that was a little unusual, and I will show you a very small example of that at the end if I have time. But the key was I designed a um, couple of hundred of museum exhibition pieces for 230 museums around the world and Disney and NASA, et cetera, et cetera. The key was that you had approximately 30 seconds to capture somebody's involvement and interest. Beyond 30 seconds, if you were lucky, they'd look at it, they're gone. Nothing's happened. So somehow you have to have a hook that you've got to get in place right away. And it isn't, doesn't come by reading a long text or a lovely document or a book, it comes out of something that immediately re resonates with those people. And when you have a case where you have something like in a museum or on the street in a public event, you don't know what each person has in their head, in their experience, in their community when they walk up to it. And that makes it a very big challenge. More, I could say much more about that, but for sake of time, I won't now. I want to talk very b briefly. I, I will just use this as a quick foil. This is just a, a simple diagram that I put together to illustrate how this was part of a project that I ran for four years, and now one of my colleagues has taken it over, for lack of my time, uh, in the Arctic on decision making. And the point here is that the scientists pick an area. I mean, they, you're an expert in something very often. And it's not that you change that. It's that you say, well, within this area, are there problems that I can address that are relevant to the society? And it's the, the science for complex social ecological systems must be both necessary and sufficient. So you need the experts in a particular area. You need to define project goals and principles within the context that you're looking at. That doesn't mean that if I do laser spectroscopy and I'm looking at farming in Nigeria, that that's directly relevant. But maybe it's relevant because you could use some part of that in terms of uh, doing analytic chemistry of the soil, for example. I'm just making up a case. But then the point is, given that framing by the scientist, then you go and you map, if you will, you characterize the stakeholders. And that's a long and difficult process, but critical and then engage with them. And then comes the research itself. After you've designed the project, if you will, with the stakeholders in terms of what's relevant. And one of them things is prioritizing and framing the research question. 
What are we talking about? Why are we doing it? What's the priority list? There can be data collection, data anal analysis, and often local people are very much involved in that. But absolutely critically and often ignored is interpretation of data. How many people here play a musical instrument or sing? Quite a few. Well, you look at the page and you have a bunch of dots on a, on a set of lines. And you can play every dot, <laughs> one note after the other, right? It's not very interesting music. It becomes interesting when you interpret that data. And whether you interpret it as a visual artist by looking at a scene and then creating your characterization of that, your impressions, your whatever it triggered for you, that's your interpretation. Science does exactly the same thing. The data doesn't talk to us. We make sense of the data. And the difference with science is that it's a social contract. So that just the fact that I've made the interpretation doesn't mean it's right. I'm not done. I have to share it, as we are doing here, and test it, and probe it, and try to falsify it. And if we can do that for a while and not have it fall apart, then we begin to say, hmm, we could use that. So this process with stakeholders eventually leading to developing scenarios for decision making at different governance levels and spatial scales, and then building capacity and support use of the scenarios for making decisions is what I was really after and what we are doing in the Arctic, for example, at the Institute. So that means dialogues with stakeholders. These two um, images are from a stakeholder dialogue with quite a few people, about 35, that we held in Iceland. And we had people from the UN, from OECD, from Alaskan uh, Native community, from the uh, Can sorry, Canadian uh, mining company CEO, um, from the uh, Gwich'in International Athabascan Native community, from the Sami Council uh, from Scandinavia. Um, it was a very interesting mixed group and a very, I think, productive, too short, but productive discussion about what the key issues that we need to address in the circumpolar Arctic. This was a little different story. This was in Gdynia in Poland on the seacoast. It's a fishing community. And the question was the, the question of uh, fishing quotas. And I started with that the request of a fisherman and a, a environmentalist, I started a uh, Polish fisheries roundtable, and the first meeting, we were not, a, it took me about nine months to even organize the meeting by interviewing, going through, doing basically ethnography, so I understood who represented what, but I didn't anticipate that in the first meeting, literally, the environmentalist, uh, one, two of them, and one of the uh, fishermen picked up chairs to throw at each other. We were not at the point of quiet discourse at that point, but we got there and now eight years later that round table without me continues because people recognize that there is a real need for mutual learning. I have this picture in here from Kamakochi in Japan, one of the monkeys, because we also have to think of the stakeholders who have no voice. Future generations. The, the flora and fauna of Earth. Very briefly, I'm going to have to skip through some stuff on the Barrow, Alaska, though it was a wonderful experience, but um, the very northernmost tip of Alaska, spending time with the Inuit communities and really looking at what are the issues for them in terms of their local ecology, including this, I don't know how well you can see it, that's a bowhead whale jawbone. Um, 
15 meters high. This is at night. This is during the day. That's the, the main um, whale, whaling captain's house. Um, let me quickly, in the very little time I've left, just mention the idea of narratives. The idea that we have stories that have kept our communities together and have identified basically our cultures since we are human beings. The sagas, the stories, the songs, the dances, the pictures, cave art you see already. So it's about the way we make sense of complex ideas and the way we can express them, not as cognitive processes only, but also emotional ones. And these are enormously important. They provide some of the visions to inspire action. And they take on different forms that resonate in different cultures. And they influence both policy and political will. And we need both. Just briefly, the, this can be in the form of like Guernica, which have influenced the way people thought about war, millions of people thought about war, or a friend and colleague of mine, Cassie Mader, who's a choreographer, a wonderful dance performance called Drift. Um, but also, in this picture in Taiwan from several years ago, an artist painted on his house a scene from the village that had been destroyed by landslide, and it is also a way of preserving the meaning of that community for the children and future generations. It was a very moving thing. But I also want to show the counter example, because given what Professor Dunlap spoke about yesterday, I think this is worth pointing out. Um, this was a resolution against Agenda 21 and sustainability in the state of Kansas, in the middle of the United States, in 2012, they passed this resolution. A state that is an agricultural state that has been in drought for three decades, and they passed this? You think, are they nuts? Well, yes, but maybe. Um, the point is, that the images are about having your own house, your own car. I haven't figured out about the teddy bear over the boy, but I, I don't know. Um, anyway, um, I'm running out of time. If you will give me three more minutes. Um, I want to talk very briefly about one, as one other aspect, which is much more around science, media, science and media. And one of that is by looking at games. And I don't mean just trivial games, but games which engage people in meaningful understanding of complex systems. I think this is one of the ways, not, not the only, but it's one of the ways we can proceed. And the game becomes a boundary object through which people from different backgrounds, different ages, different experience, different cultures can engage. And it's by doing this in a multimodal way that is augmented reality, for example. The physical part is very important. Just doing it on the screen has very different effects, and we now have research on this, and I, I'll mention it briefly. Um, to, uh, we are observing how people are do using this in direct actions, and we're basically trying to understand social processes in the creative search for socially innovative solutions. We need to understand how that happens and how values are exchanged. And gaming the future is something I've invented and we now have a prototype. Um, it just simply, you build a landscape with Legos and here is a prototype just that we did in September in Rome. It is a project with the Templeton Foundation funding and Lego Foundation. Uh, Vittorio Loretto is the PI, and uh, Stefan Turner at, in um, Vienna, Andreas Ripstorf at Oros in Denmark. Um, and basically, as you make a move and you simply build something here, number one, we know who made the move when, because we have RFID tags on every individual. 
this is just a prototype version, but what they see is the consequence of an action, either theirs or others. And the interesting thing is the dialogue that goes on between people as they attempt to make solutions. One can now imagine this kind of a landscape here in Taiwan, Taipei, and one in Rome, and another in New York, and they're interdependent. Now we have to have a conversation about the energy we're using, the water we're sending from Taipei to Rome, or products. So we, it's a way of doing this directly. And I promised to come back to Paul Crutzen, and this is the same toy. Let's see if I can do it. Um, this little object, which I built about 30 years ago, I think, in my uh, workshop, uh, which still is, it just was a prototype. Um, but this has been used all over the world. I mean, large versions and the small version we made, tens of thousands of the toys were produced commercially. Um, but this was my actual prototype. Well, I had it at a meeting, and if you see the young children here talking to each other, not to me, it's the, with each other, or this woman in Beijing, or these girls in Delhi, I believe it was, but also this gentleman who was Paul Crutzen, who when Klaus Tupper, the director of the institute, said, P Paul, please sit down. We have to start the meeting. He said, no, 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 wait a minute. I have to try this. Uh, but he's using the same thing they are because it's about exploring the world and asking questions and going from there to finding solutions. Let me stop there. Thank you. <laughs>